the force to have uh, Mindy with us here today. Uh, she's a professor of the Law of Contract at Oxford University um, and also the Dean Elect of the Law Faculty at Oxford University. Uh, she's an expert in contract restitution and comparative contract law uh, and she's got a really fascinating topic for us today on um, legal transplant, a working misunderstanding, which is a topic about transplanting law from a Judeo-Christian society into a Confucian one. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hear, hearing what she has to say. Thank you. Thank Mindy. you. Thank you very much. Okay, well, first I want to thank May for the invitation. Um, it's the first time I've um, lectured to a law firm. <laughs> um, so I want to start by saying, well, every negative has a positive. We all need that at the moment. Um, so first of all, the pandemic, thank you, the pandemic, the COVID-19 means I'm stranded in paradise in New Zealand. And um, <clears throat> thank you, May, for letting me stay in your basement and sneak up periodically to steal food, see the movie Parasite. Um, second is my own, second sort of, cloud with a silver lining is my own reluctant immigration as a 10 year old from Taiwan to New Zealand, and then much later on from New Zealand to the UK. So you could say that I'm talking about legal transplant, but I myself, I've been transplanted twice, and both times I wasn't happy about it. Um, I remember as a 10 year old saying to my parents, I'll stay with my grandma, uh, I'll come and see you when you're in New Zealand, and they said, shut up and get on the plane. Um, but at least it means that I've got, you know, two heads for the purposes of this paper, one Eastern and one Western. I've also now lived in the old world, UK, and the new world, New Zealand. The third cloud with a silver lining is British imperialism, because it, it means that I could teach law in Singapore, where um, Britain colonised, uh, English is the official language, and English contract law is substantially the same as the law in the UK. Ha ha, I thought cunningly, I can spend time with people who look more like me, eat fabulous food, and more or less rehash my contract lectures. At least that's what I thought. So when I started to study Singapore law, I found a line of Singaporean cases that professed to be following English law, but somehow interpreted and applied it to reach opposite conclusions. It was really very surprising indeed. And I got wondering how this divergent uh, evolutionary path could be explained. Well, you might ask, why should we care? Well, quite apart from the intrinsic interest, the answer to the question should shine a light on some controversial issues in comparative law. If you look at PowerPoint 2. First, does legal borrowing uh, from one system to another actually work? What's the relationship between law and society? Be society meaning culture, religion, values, politics, and economics. Does law change society or does society change the law? Is harmonization and convergence possible across jurisdictions with a high degree of pluralism? Now the importance of these questions can be seen in PowerPoint 3 the scale of legal transplant in colonial history. In development programs that involve transplants into Africa and South America after World War II, and also more recently into Cambodia. The development of new legal orders after the collapse of communism in the for former Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe, and even within existing communist states as such as China, they only got their contract law in 1999, and a lot of it was cut and paste from all kinds of sources. And lastly, the moves towards regional codes, especially in contract and commercial law, like principles of European contract law, like uh, CISG, the Vienna Convention, and so on, the Unidrat. Now, the contract laws of Asian jurisdictions tells the story of legal transplant. The borrowing of foreign laws, mainly English common law, German law and some French law and their subsequent development in their new homes. So if you look at PowerPoint 4, nearly a third of the world's population live in regions where the law is marked by the common law. This is the legacy of Great Britain's colonial history and, and we are living in one of these jurisdictions. 
Even after their independence, the substantive and procedural laws of these jurisdictions remain strongly influenced by uh, the legal ideas, the institutions, and the methods of the common law. Within Asia, Hong Kong, Singapore have retained the common law system. India, Malaysia, Myanmar have codified English contract law. And the story of, of a lot of civilian jurisdictions in Asia, Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, uh, with the notable exception of China, is directly linked to Japan. The transplant is not by colonialism of European states, but by Japan's early adoption of European private law, especially German, but also French, uh, during the Meiji Restoration, and then Japan's subsequent colonization of these countries. And I come from, well, man, I come from Taiwan, one of these countries. The Philippines is Spanish, has Spanish and US influence. China's contract law is a product of mixed reception. In their words, it's a result of consciousness, um, <clears throat> consciousness self-determination, those are the words they use, and selective, uh, are we freezing? Are we, have we been all right? Yeah, okay, I'll just keep going. Um, right, uh, so, so it's aimed at developing what they call a socialist market economy. The final product is what I call a stir fry. <clears throat> it's a fusion of civil law, common law, international restatements, and so, all supplemented by judicial interpretations of the Supreme People's Courts, which operates like quasi-legislation. So, um, and the most recent Asian codification is that of Cambodia, and this was drafted with the assistance of Japanese legal experts and is, like Chinese law, heavily influenced by global trends in harmonization of contract laws. Now, in contrast, Indonesia is anachronistic and, frankly speaking, completely bewildering. They've got three contract laws operating simultaneously. Um, it's hard to imagine how it even works. First are the indigenous laws of different ethnic groups, so this is already pluralistic. Second, you've got Islamic contract law, which is also pluralistic because of the different schools of Islam. Uh, Indonesia is the most populous Muslim majority country in the world. And the third system is Dutch contract law, which is the main law for commercial contracts. And it's Dutch law, which is based on French law, and it's been enforced in Indonesia from 1846. But get this, it's in Dutch, and there is no official Indonesian language translation. 98% of lawyers and judges do not understand Dutch or French, and Dutch contract law was substantially reformed uh, in 1992. So it's crazy psychedelic stuff. It's like, I feel like David Attenborough, it's like discovering a new species that you just can't believe exist and it's not in some far-flung corner of the world. Like I said, it's in the fourth most populous country with 255 million people. So what's the theory on legal transplant? Is it possible? There are at least three answers. Look at PowerPoint 5. At one extreme, you've got Pierre Lagrande and Montesquieu, and they say that legal transplant is impossible. Laws got no autonomous existence. Any legal transplant is only skin deep. It's only words, it's only law on the books. Once it's cut off from its roots, it ceases to exist as such, and it becomes something else. Law mirrors society and society molds the law. At the other extreme is Alan Watson, um, and he sees legal transplants from one system to another as easy peasy. He points to the scale of reception of Roman law and the spread of English common law, and he emphasizes just how easy it is to transplant law and its capacity for long life. And um, he says this happens and succeeds even where the transplanted law does not fit the receiving society's needs, its conception of justice, or the desires of the ruling elite. And he concludes that very little is original in law. Borrowing is the main way that laws change. And this must be absolutely right. Um, I've read loads of Law Reform Commission reports all over the world, and frankly, they don't know the word plagiarism because they freely just cut and paste from each other. Uh, now, 
My view is that both sides are right and they're also wrong. True, there are lots of examples of successful legal transplants, but society inevitably exerts pressure on that law. A tomato plant moved from one place to another is still a tomato plant, but at how it develops afterwards depends on the soil, the temperature, the wildlife, and so on, and its new home, PowerPoint 6. A law in one country expressed in exactly the same wording in another is not the same rule. Context is everything. The once transplanted is different in its new home. So my argument is that, as with so many areas of life and law and love, the answer is not black or white, yes or no, there are many, many shades of gray, perhaps more than 50. Where law evolved in one society is parachuted into another society, the result may range along the entire continuum from rejection to smooth reception. Transplants vary so much that broad generalizations stated as a grand transplant theory is unhelpful. The relationship between law and society is dynamic, multi-layered, interactive, and it's not possible to give a neat and tidy, simple answer. So does legal transplant work? Well, the answer is, it depends. We need to identify the particular factors that determine the development of particular transplants. There is no choice but to get down and dirty and look at it case by case. And I'm going to take one case study. I'll explain the divergent case law in two jurisdictions before I look at the factors that might explain the divergence. So the line of cases that led to such different interpretations in Singapore and English law relates to non-commercial guarantees. The typical scenario is a primary debtor who gets into financial trouble. It's inevitably a he. He then gets a family member, typically his wife, to guarantee the loan or to put up their family home as security for the loan. Um, and when he defaults, the guarantee is called in. Can the wife escape? Um, this area of law is also known as sexually transmitted debt. Um, there are three parties. The Supreme Court in the UK has held that the guarantor wife can escape if she can show, look at your PowerPoint 8, that her Number one, that her consent to the guarantee was tainted by some recognized vitiating factors, such as duress, misrepresentation, or in our case, undue influence. Second, that the lender knows, number one, that the guarantor is not acting commercially, that is, she's the husband, she's the you know, spouse, uh, non-married cohabitee, same-sex cohabitee, parent, child, and so on. Uh, and second, that, that the guarantor obtains no direct benefit from the loan. And thirdly, that the lender fails to take reasonable steps to ensure that the guarantor understands what she's doing, mainly by recommending or insisting that she obtains independent advice. The relevant vitiating factor here is usually undue influence. Look at PowerPoint 9. And you will remember that this deals with the exploitation of a relationship of trust and confidence to obtain an undue advantage. And it can be proved either, uh, look at PowerPoint 9, uh, by, it can be proved by one party exerting overt pressure to induce the other's consent, or by inference from a relationship of influence and a transaction calling for an explanation and no reasonable explanation being forthcoming. Now, all of this is accepted over and over. The law is cited and in Singapore, and it's accepted as Singaporean law. And yet, very, very different interpretations. Let's start with three English cases, and then I'll give you examples of um, three or four Singaporean cases. If you start with PowerPoint 11, anyway. Olcard and Skinner. <clears throat> now, that's our classic example of a claimant who is a young woman who took a vow of poverty, chastity, and obedience, and she eventually joins the convent as a full member. The rules of the convent forbade the nuns from seeking outside advice without the per permission of the mother superior, and they imposed uh, the most absolute submission by the nuns to the mother superior, who was to be regarded as the voice of God. 
Now, of course, she's very rich. There would be no case unless she was very rich. And she gave her very substantial inheritance to the mother superior. And note that the law of undue influence operates on gifts as well as contracts. Now, many years later, she decides to leave the order and she seeks the return of what was left of her transfer. The court found undue influence from the relationship of influence and the transaction calling for an explanation, which the mother superior could not rebut because she didn't insist that the nun receive independent advice before the transfer. Uh, so look at PowerPoint 12. In the case, in the guarantee case of Royal Bank of Scotland and Coleman, this involved a husband and wife who were Hasidic Jews, where the wife's upbringing and education prepared her principally for marriage within her own religious community and for a life of subservience to the wishes of her husband. Um, her husband's judgment in matters of finance and business were to be followed without question, and she did that. She was not merely disinclined to second guess her on matters of business, but she regarded herself as obliged to do so. Um, are we? Are we still going? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I keep getting little signals saying that it's um, unstable. All right. So, another case. Um, I know. Sometimes yeah. you go a little bit like um, R2D2, but then it just keeps going. Okay. So All right. Well, as long as you're getting the gist of it, I guess. Okay. Bank of Scotland and Bennett. The husband uh, used wounding and insulting language to accuse his wife of disloyalty when she didn't want to guarantee his debts. Um, and he said that she would be a waste of rations if she didn't guarantee his debts and she would be splitting up the family. The judge found actual undue influence in the moral blackmail amounting to coercion and victimization. Now, undue influence was also found in BCCI and Abudi. Uh, this involved Iraqi Jews. She was 17, he was 47, she hardly spoke English, all the, all the usual. She was confined to the domestic sphere, she was expected to obey without question, and the bank insisted that she was brought in for advice on her own, without him being present. Um, he comes running in, starts shouting at her and saying, you know, you bloody lawyers, you're taking too long. Why don't you just get her to sign? Everyone ends up in tears, you know. Anyway, the, the courts found undue influence. Now, three Singapore cases. Singapore is a colony uh, from its founding in 1819. Um, even after independence, the default was English law, unless otherwise specified. In practice, English law is invariably cited by counsel and court. It's overwhelmingly accepted as persuasive and it's routinely applied. So much so that um, leading commentators criticize Singapore as being a poor carbon copy of English law. So this was the case, these are the cases that got raised my eyebrows. Overseas Chinese Banking Corporation and Ching Sok Lee. The father is, the father slash husband is a property developer. He gets a guarantee of his um, wife, and 23-year-old son for the liabilities of the company amounting to 5.5 million Singapore dollars. The court found that the father uh, was a man of ungovernable temper who was occasionally violent to his wife. He also abused the son um, verbally and in a cruel and unusual manner, causing the son to burn himself with cigarettes to forget the mental pain that his father was inflicting on him. So he was self-harming. The father had firmly told them to go and sign the guarantee and don't ask too many questions. The judge said that it was heartbreaking to hear the evidence of the father's exceptional harshness and cruelty, and he accepted that they were fearful of him. And so the court found no undue influence. And so you might wonder why. The court's reasoning was that the father meant the best for the family. Um, there was no rhyme or reason why the father should have wanted to exploit them or victimize them. On the contrary, the father was uh, promoting the interests of the family and of the son. 
Secondly, he said the wife and the son were the formal owners of the company. Third, they knew what they were doing. The lender, and, and fourthly, the lender through the solicitor who dealt with the wife and son did not know of any undue influence or of any circumstance which ought to have alerted her. So, um, gosh, what a surprise. The lender didn't see them beating each other up and being nasty. They never will. But it's in the nature of these sorts of things that it happens behind closed doors. PowerPoint 14. Bank of East Asia and Modi Sonal. Here, the daughter signed the guarantee after her father became very angry and told her that if she didn't, she would be responsible for the loss of everything he had worked for and it would be all her fault. And the court found no undue influence because first, they said the father did not ap appear to be the imperious head of household that he was made out to be. Indeed, they said, he appeared to be more lamb than lion. In any case, they said it would be an exaggeration to castigate his conduct as undue influence because there must be some some unfair or improper conduct, some coercion, some form of misleading. Second, they said the daughter was a shareholder. The daughter was a shareholder and so she stood to benefit. The daughter knew what she was doing. She has an MBA from the United States and she is no babe in the woods. Um, and thirdly, uh, and lastly, the bank was not put on inquiry because it didn't see anything um, untoward. Okay, third case, Standard Chartered Bank and Uniden Systems. The guarantee was enforced against the wife. No undue, no, you know, it was all valid because they said, well, she was a director of the company and the husband's business was the source of the family's income. It was in her interest to give the guarantee. Secondly, the wife has a university degree and she knew she was signing a guarantee. Um, even if she had known that it exposed her unlimited liability, which she did not, so he had misrepresented to her. They said that she would still have agreed if she had known the truth. Um, she willingly accepted her husband's dominance of her. She trusted him completely. She did not think he would put her in a risky position. And again, there was nothing untoward. There was no, they did not perceive any intimidation or overbearing or bullying, okay? so. The Singaporean courts are clearly very reluctant to find undue influence in the family guarantee business situation. And so they've twisted the interpretation of the doctrine in three ways. So here is the working misunderstanding. First, they insist on wrongdoing, on bad faith and bad conduct. Neither of these are necessary in the common law. Second, the Singapore cases say that there can't be undue influence if the complainant knows what they're doing. But this ignores the essence of undue influence, which is not lack of understanding, but lack of independence. English cases recognize that someone who refuses to get independent advice or to follow it because of their systematic deference to the other party is just the sort of person most in need of the doctrine's protection. Now, I came to understand this when, when I, uh, in re relation to my friend. Okay, so my friend is a lawyer, right? She is a family lawyer. She, um, her husband left her with eight sons, right? He left her um, uh, with, uh, with eight sons and then he took up with another, with a, with, he's a, he was a colleague of mine. So he's a friend of mine he, and he took up, took up with a young male student and then he left the male student and he took up with another woman and then he had twins with her and then he asked my friend who he left, his first wife with eight sons and said, would she guarantee his debt for his new home? And she said, I don't know what to do, Mindy. What do you think? And I said, are you crazy? You know, I said, what would you tell your own clients if they asked you about that? You know, so, and I thought, boom, that's what undue influence is getting at. This is what we're talking about. It's not about not understanding what you're doing. It's about the fact that you're so enamored of someone. It's about love, respect, um, commitment to someone. And uh, that, that's the situation we're in. Okay. Thirdly, the Singapore case says there's no undue influence if the complainant is a shareholder. Um, 
or a director because she, she would benefit from giving the guarantee. But the English cases recognize that being a shareholder or even a director is inconclusive because these roles may well be purely formal, they often are, they're just purely on paper, they're for tax purposes, and the complainant may not even know that they are down on the, as shareholders. So how do we explain these divergent um, interpretations? PowerPoint 16. Um, I think that the life of a legal transplant depends on at least four factors. First, how receptive is the receiving system to the transplant? Singapore is highly receptive because it sees itself as an international financial hub. And so it's keen to inspire confidence in those doing business in Singapore by um, attaching itself to the English commercial and com contract law, which has high prestige, is easily accessible and shares the same language. The second point is influence on the life of a transplant is the receiving legal system's familiarity with the formal legal order of the originating system. Singapore also scores really highly there. It's formally adopted um, English legal institutions. My internet, okay. Most uh, Singaporean judges and lawyers are either trained in England or in Singapore. And the local law schools often use English textbooks and they are steeped in the English common law tradition. Um, and th thirdly, the third influence on the life of the transplant is the nature and meaning of the transplanted rules. Uh, transplant via legislation is much more likely to have been adapted to the local conditions before transplant, but undue influence was received as precedent and this can only be adapted after the transplant. The clearer the meaning of the transplanted rules, the less room there is for creative adaptation. So let's compare, say, the certainty of the signature rule, if you sign, you're bound, right? With the much more abstract, open-ended notions like reasonableness, and in our case, in a relationship of influence, a transaction calling for an explanation, which are clearly socially calibrated ideas. The fourth influence on the life of a transplant is the extent to which the subject matter of the transplant grates, rubs up against the informal legal order of the receiving society. Now, the informal legal order are the internalized norms, conventions, customs, collective value systems that define what is good and bad, what's acceptable and unacceptable, what's desirable or undesirable, what's important and unimportant. And they're enforced informally through non-legal mechanisms such as reputation and trust. Okay, remember Watson's insulation, uh, uh, well, I didn't tell you about that, so I, I just skipped over that. But so remember that uh, Gunter Tobner reminds us that laws ties to society are highly selective, and they vary from loose coupling to tight interwovenness, okay? The rule of thumb is that the more personal and political the subject matter, the more that legal transplants will be resisted. So um, the law on non-commercial guarantees belongs at the borderline between commercial and family. So there's selective connectivity with the social context. So what is the difference between the soil from which the undue influence doctrine evolved and the soil into which it's being planted that accounts for the differences that we've seen? Now, we know that making this sort of social comparison is fraught with dangers. We have to be careful not to caricature a culture, especially one as complex and pluralistic as Singapore. They have four national languages. They have four um, different cultures that they recognize as the national cultures. There's very wide ethnic, religious, and linguistic diversity. So the entire spectrum of views can be found there. Nevertheless, still, there are certain dominant strains and centers of gravity. Look at PowerPoint 17. 75% of Singaporeans are ethnically Chinese. Confucianism is an integral part of Chinese culture and social organization. It's synonymous with Chinese civilization, 
with what it means to be Chinese and it's part of the DNA. Confucianism is a perfectionist virtue ethic. It's a guide to proper behavior. It's an all embracing um, being built into the heritage, the language, the ritual, the traditions. Some aspects like ancestor worship and the strong preference for sons is declining, but it's still really strong. Um, so <laughs> for example, my parents were unfortunate enough to have four daughters and no sons. And you know they still protest too much that daughters are as good as sons. And I remember saying to my parents, you know, some I say, Mum, I'm 55. You can stop saying that now, you know, that daughters are as good as, as, as sons. But some aspects of Confucianism are remarkably persistent, chiefly the core virtues of filial piety and submission to your parents. And I want to put forward three overlapping aspects of Confucianism contrasted to broadly Western Judeo-Christian values to explain why undue influence manifests as it does in Singapore. Now, I'm not arguing that Confucianism is the only factor in play. It's probably not even a self-conscious factor in play. But my argument is that Confucianism explains the roots of three overlapping and mutually reinforcing tendencies that provides insight into why undue influence was interpreted so differently in Singapore. And I'll present them as broadly contrasting um, Western and, and Eastern values. Look at PowerPoint 19. First, we have the contrast between equality and hierarchy. In the West, we try to achieve social order and harmony by a system of rights that can be agreed by equals. And this is protected by law. In the East, social order is achieved by observing a very comprehensive code of conduct based on rigid hierarchy of generational sequence, gender, and age. Where you are in the hierarchy and what this requires ex is expressed in an elaborate terminology of titles. I have six uncles and five aunts, and each has a completely different title, as, their res as does their respective spouses. So for example, the husband of the third auntie on my father's side has a different title from everyone else. And when I arrived in New Zealand and found out that in English, all these people were covered by the terms uncle and aunts, I thought, this is going to be a doddle, you know? The core relationship in Confucianism is father and son. The son must give willing obedience and support to the father. The son can even, they can persuade, but they can never oppose. And they should even hide the father's wrongdoing from the state. Fathers have almost absolute power over the child. They can, traditionally, they could even put the child to death, especially for being unfilial. The father-son relationship is generalized out to all other relationships than the family. The family is the prototype of all social organizations. It is the metaphor for community, country, and universe. Violations are highly unacceptable, and it's seen as ethically and morally evil. All right, um, and you know when I, I, I really dislike Confucianism, partly because as a woman there is no place for women at all. Right, they submit to everyone. Western cultures, in contrast, I mean they also emphasize the importance of, of honoring one's parents. And patriarchy also marks Western society historically and unfortunately not so historically. But there isn't the deontological commitment and the stringency of powers and duties of Confucianism. So important kinds of moral differences may consist in those differing emphasis given to values that are shared across cultural traditions. So the second contrast is between persons and roles. Look at PowerPoint 20. The West places primary importance on persons and his or her uniqueness. The person is the subject of its most significant ideas, such as freedom, salvation, reason, contract, love. Meanwhile, Confucianism puts primary importance on your conformity to your role. 
where you are in relation to other people and how you should behave in that role. Ritualized conduct is given an aesthetic dimension in the cultivation of the good life. This then reduces the importance and the legitimacy of individual differences and individual choices. The concept of an individual right is alien to the Chinese tradition. In the West, where love is the prescribed emotion between family members, in Chinese societies, it is respect, which requires no personal involvement while not precluding it. Submission was not in the last analysis to persons, but to a pattern of personal relationships that is held to have ultimate validity. The dominant Chinese emotions are respect, obligation, duty to elders, and to males. And I can vouch for this, not least from my experience of working with, um, uh, on the principles of Asian contract law project, where um, I was thought to be consistently behaving out of line and be you know, behaving really badly. And I was pulled aside by a Korean professor who said to me, Mindy, you have three sons and you love your three sons. Now you must love Professor Kanayama like you love your three sons, um, i.e., you know, stop being such a horrible person and disagreeing with them and raising problems. Now the contrast is brought out further in the different conceptions of power and subordination. Historically in the Western societies, the legitimate powers of fathers, sovereigns or states was derived ultimately from God. Power was seen as personal and it's exercised as intentional acts of individuals, but acting within boundaries of their jurisdictions. So self-righteous disobedience could always be justified by reference to the will of God or because the superior has exceeded their jurisdiction. And this led to legal frameworks that regulated conflicts between free individuals and notions of individual rights. In contrast, the Confucian conception of the father-son relationship recognizes no divine source of legitimacy. It is just seen as inherently correct. It just is. It leaves no point of leverage for disobedience. It led to no institutions for resolving conflicts, no notions of personal rights. On this view, submission was not to the person, but to the role, to a pattern of relationships that was held to have ultimate validity. And this helped to explain for me, my experience growing up, with the conflicts I had with my father, who would say to me in disgust, I send you to law school and you argue with me, right? He would be furious. It had nothing to do with who was right or wrong. It had to do with the very fact that I was disagreeing with my father. Now, when I wrote my first research paper in New Zealand, um, some of you might have been taught by this person who then went to Auckland. He called me in to discuss it. Um, and uh, I let her, he, he thought my paper was good enough, but, he, but when we discussed it, I was actually highly critical of the law. And he said, why didn't you put these things in your paper? Um, um, I said, but, but, but that would be so rude, you know, because I didn't think you could write like that, right? Because he was a judge. So how could I criticize him in that way? I didn't realize that I'd imbibed quite a lot of these values. So the third uh, value contrast is between individualism and collectivism, PowerPoint 21. In the West, we em the emphasis on the moral is on the moral worth and rights of the individual. The key concept is freedom, it's autonomy. Um, you know, my teenage children, they tell me, I can do what I want, you know, that kind of freedom. Confucianism emphasizes kinship relationships, mutual dependence, maintaining collective security and well-being is prioritized over individual uh, interests. The individual is seen as insignificant without the family and the wider community. So family and not the individual is the basic unit of society. And it's no accident that the Chinese write their family name first, followed by their given names. Um, it can even be seen in the way that um, people are reacting to the COVID-19. You know, China 
uh, people felt that they should sacrifice themselves for the greater good. Whereas in the, e in the West, you can see the reports coming out of England that people are saying, you know, basically, fuck it, I'm going out. You know, they're, they're still, they're do they see themselves as individuals, not just as members of the collective. Now, the contrast in the respective views of the relationship between the self and the society has been described as that between a slice of a pie in the West, where you have distinct edges and you can you can you're you're part of the whole but you have distinct edges versus in the east being ingredients swirling around in the soup in fact i decided the picture wasn't quite right because it's more like a blended soup so you can't even see the bits of broccoli you know it's like a, a cream soup right your identity and your sense of self is inextricably established only in the context of the whole and this is reflected in my experience growing up. There were four girls in our family and my parents, my mother insisted that all clothing was shared. I absolutely hated that, right? And so I um, learned to sew because of that, right? And I would save my money and I would go down and I would buy the offcuts and I would buy clothes that would be mine, right? Um, this collectivism expresses itself in a core um, for self-sacrifice, self-restraint, self-effacement, and the avoidance of conflict. Transgressions dishonor the whole family. Now, the former head of my college was used to dealing with such self-effacing, conflict-avoiding, submissive Chinese people because she's an expert on Oriental antiquities. And she once, she was always puzzled by me, and she once said to me in front of my visiting parents, Mindy, I never think of you as very Chinese. Now, this is an insult, by the way. Um, you know, it means I'm not respectful. The imperative to conform makes shame the effect of control technique, right? You, you, so we, we grew up with this. If you do this, you will shame the family, you know? In the West, it's a more personal concept, guilt, okay? It's not all bad. The interaction is one of reciprocity. In exchange for submission and passivity, the subordinate can, ex can expect care and resources. While the West emphasizes political and indi individual rights, the East emphasizes education and economic security. Now, my friends and me um, completely, uh, you know, this was reflected also in the way I grew up, that um, regarding our holiday earnings, they kept it all, but they paid rent. And my parents said, oh, that's disgusting, parents charging their children rent. But in my family, it was expected that they, I paid no rent, but it was expected that I would willingly give all of my earnings to my parents. So you can, I can summarize these three features. Um, these three features of Chinese culture are duplicated in the family business, all right? Um, so family relationships are reinforced by the employer-employee relationship. So they, they say, oh, you're part of the family. So it's all about obedience to authority, priority of the collective good, conformity to roles, avoidance of conflict. And this is all thought to have contributed to the economic miracle of the Asian tigers after World War II. 80% of Singaporean families are family, uh, family Singaporean businesses are family businesses and they're overwhelmingly Chinese. Refusal to obey the patriarch is difficult, if not impossible, for family members and employees. The values are so deeply ingrained, even if you wanted to disobey, you would find it emotionally distressing to do so. And, it, and you would be highly vulnerable to the pressure to conform. And that is precisely the gist of undue influence. Western views about honest confrontation and clearing the air are unacceptable. I remember distinctly three times I tried it with my father, and um, believe me, I got shouted at. I got it, it, you know, because it causes the superior to lose face. They cannot even start with it. Okay. Conversely, success um, gives face to the family, right? So, and, and this is reflected in my parents' tendency to announce to their friends, taxi drivers, waiters, random people on the street, where, when they're walking with me, she's an Oxford professor, you know, and me being horribly, horribly embarrassed. Right, but
But this has also got a downside. It means a reluctance to seek outside help, a reluctance to admit problems, and to wind up failing businesses. Okay, and here you can see it's reflected in cases in employer-employee relationships. Um, in the English case of Credit Leonese and Birch, a junior employee of 10 years standing gave a personal guarantee to an unlimited charge on her flat to secure her employer's existing debts and slightly extend his overdraft, totaling a quarter of a million pounds. Um, and despite very little evidence of undue influence, the court said the transaction was one which shocks the conscience of the court, particularly when they said, well, they weren't even having a romantic relationship. They set aside the transaction. In contrast, in Singapore, where two employees um, uh, guaranteed the business debts of the employer for $10 million, the employee's earnings themselves never exceeded $600 to $2,000 a month. Um, the evidence showed that they were loyal and dedicated employees. They did whatever the employer required. Um, they signed the documents whenever they were asked. They didn't know what the documents were. The court said no undue influence because they acted out of abiding faith in their employer's ability and they were not coerced or bulldozed. Now, in Singapore, Confucianism is actually government policy. In 1980s, they launched the Asian Values Campaign and then followed by the Confucian Ethics Campaign, introduced uh, to strengthen family ties against the undesirable aspects of Anglo-American culture. This was replaced by the White Paper on Shared Values, um, PowerPoint 12, which talks of nation before community, society above self, family as the basic unity of unit of society, consensus in conflict, racial and religious harmony. Now, of course, these are all rather self-serving to those in authority. Once you're at the um, top, of course, you, you want to extend these. The white paper stresses government by wise and honorable men who are trusted and respected by the people. Now, this has huge consequences for, they have the same problem in their defamation law. Um, which has been used to silence political opposition. They use it to, uh, if, if you want to accuse politicians of corruption, this is regarded as an attack on their moral authority and as undermining effective government and social order. So the former and the current prime ministers have brought tons of defamation actions and they have never lost. Um, and although Singapore recognizes the same defenses of justification and fair comment, they, they are often given exceptionally narrow scope. So, undue influence evolved from a very different worldview in England. It sees parties as individuals rather than as part of the collective, and it regards unquestioning obedience, trust, and self-sacrifice, not as virtues, but as conditions that might require equity's protection. In contrast, finding undue influence in family business context in Singapore would grate against the informal legal order. It amounts to saying that the father does something wrong in getting his wife or adult children to support the family business. It impliedly supports patriarchal loss of face by the disobedience of his wife or child. It would support conduct which is socially regarded as shameful and disgraceful. So it's not surprising that Singaporean courts have applied the doctrine in this way. In, indeed, it would be surprising if it did not. So let's go back to the beginning of this lecture. If the question is whether legal transplants are possible, the answer is patently yes, but that's just the start. Um, fixating on it is like fixating on parenthood as being all about giving birth. As the mother of three grown sons, I know that once you've given birth, that's when all the trouble begins. So instead, we've got to turn our attention to what happens after the transplant. And I'll conclude with three remarks. We see that society, first we see that society can reconstruct the legal transplant while assimilating it. So it's too simplistic to say that law reform will always facilitate a smooth transition from custom to modernity, from status to contract. Singapore absorbed the transplant without losing what's authentically local. And they did so without overtly admitting
to any intentional departure. They achieved a working misunderstanding. So in this sense, um, transplant hasn't failed. It's just been attuned to local values. I have to say, when I give this paper in Singapore, they really don't like it because they think I'm accusing them of being backward. I'm not at all. I, I'm the one that noted this. It was really interesting that although the, the cases are there, they never, ever, they teach the law and they'd say, we have the same law as England. Um, our law is identical, right? So they saw what they thought they should see. Okay, the second point is that local norms are neither immutable nor are they necessarily good. When you have a transplant, you have, it, it is a legal irritant and it can trigger reactions in the recipient legal system and they can reevaluate traditional values. And in all the um, case law, there's just one going against the flow. In that case, undue influence was found where the son guaranteed the family business debt uh, to the tune of millions. The son's life was tightly controlled. He couldn't go out with friends, eat out, sleep late, have girlfriends. His parents wouldn't let him study abroad or pursue his aspirations to be a writer and photographer. The trial judge said, it may never be known whether it is better not to have a father at all than to have one who overwhelms his son and dominates him completely. Are we still? Yep. Okay, I'm nearly at the end. Um, so, actually, this when I read what the judge said, I thought, hey, that's what my life was like when I was at home. When it, uh, even when I got married, I used to get really twitchy at ten o'clock because that was when I had to be at home. Okay. So finally, the issue is not which is better, east or west. Rather, it's the importance of being more aware of the underlying assumptions of different cultures and different legal systems. The East and West rank values differently. They focus on different goods of an er uh, ethical flourishing life. The East on the good of belonging to the community and of social responsibility, and the West of the good of respect for the individual. But each also holds dangers. In the East of failing to protect individuals' interests against community demands, and in the West of having an excessively atomistic or individualistic conception of human beings and ignoring their social and collective nature. So to understand the, the, the last PowerPoint, to understand legal transplants, we have to step outside our own world and to enter the world of the other. This is a lot more difficult than we might imagine because we're all captives of the pictures in our heads, of our belief that the world as we've experienced it is the world as it actually and rightly exists. And even if we recognize differences, we might not be able to appreciate their appeal or share the beliefs or place the same importance on them relative to other values that we might hold. But we can try. So that's the um, end of my talk. Um, I see that we haven't got very long. But um, if you violently disagree, I would love to hear from you. <laughs> um, I hope that wasn't too painful for you and um, I enjoyed giving it. Thank you. Shall I sign off now, May? Okay, I'll sign off. Hang, hang on, Caleb, did you want to uh, give the vote of thanks? Was yeah, I just want to say thank you very much. That was fascinating. I really enjoyed it and I'm sure others did too. It was a really good perspective and yeah, a really fascinating issue that sort of I hadn't really considered in much depth before. So thank you. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. All right, thank you. Okay, bye then. Thank you so much. Thank you.